Here's a familiar piece to a lot of people. It's by Henry Purcell from Dido and Ennius, Act 3, Scene 2. It's um, the scene where Dido is singing about her death. And it, after this recitative and dialogue going on here, we get a theme in the beginning of the aria. Notice that now the theme is in the bass. Uh, when we were looking at the Mozart, it was, let's see how long, 1, 2, 3, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 measures. This, though, is just one, well, if you even count that as a full measure, let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 measures long. Kind of an interesting thing that it's just this 5. Okay, so it's shorter, and it's in the bass. And what's our terms? The Pasacalia was... Um, a pattern, a baseline pattern, and the chaconne means that you preserve the chord progression even if you change your bass in some ways. Now those, those two terms are actually pretty flexible and people use them in various ways as time, as, as you move through time in the history of music. So you can't really count on them meaning those two things always. They might be labeled that, they might be labeled chaconne and, and the baseline does stay the whole way. So they become flexible, but they both indicate for sure a continuous variation type. Very different from the sectional variations. And we made the case, on, or I made the, the statement that the continuous variation is interesting for the way that the upper melody aligns with the bass. Here, we're, since we're dealing with, uh, with this aria, we've got a song, uh, a melody sung, and how it aligns with the bass. Notice where the bass line starts. That's the first note of it. It comes down chromatically to five, three, four, five, one. So get that scheme in mind. And notice how it starts here. Goes down chromatically. And there's a cadence. But look what's going on in the melody at that spot. It's, there's a point of breath right there, but you're midway through the bass pattern. May my wrongs create no trouble. And as you sing, you could create a break there, but the words say, create no trouble, no trouble in thy breast. May my wrongs create no trouble, no trouble in thy breast. So you've, you've got a lot of encouragement from the words to pull this line on up to three but not an IAC keep going and I think if you listen to a recording I'll try and get one up for you so that you can hear how you really it sounds natural to push right through this yes there there's the end there's potentially an IAC here but you don't hear that because the melody pushes through heads up to this climactic moment and then comes back down and ends here in thy breast, scale degree two, by ending there in the melody, you've created a half cadence, sort of, because it's going to push on through. In other words, they're not in alignment. The bass pattern, the theme is, uh, not, it's getting close to the end, but it's not at the end. And the, the upper part is making that spot at the end. They're out of alignment. Then right when you get to here, in the bass pattern, the cadence, you're starting something new. When I am laid begins right there. There's an overlap. Again, the momentum keeps going. Let's look, let's continue to look for places where the bass pattern ends and the top part continues. Okay, here's the second ending. Remember me kicks in. Remember me, but ah, oh, forget my fate. Remember Me begins before the bass line has come to its authentic cadence. Here's the pattern starting only now. Coming on down. It ends here. Okay, so she sings, but ah, forget my fate. And the ah goes up to scale degree 3 again, scale degree 4, scale degree 5. The melody's goal is to head up to here, my fate pushing through the point where there could have been closure. So again, they're out of alignment. One ends, the other continues. It ends in the melody, and the bass melody is now in the middle of its statement. They're out of alignment. 
They're not in sync with one another. Remember me kicks in here. But ah, uh, forget my fate. Okay, now finally, look. The bass line is going 5-5-1. That's the way the, the line ends. Chromatic descent, cadence. Ah, uh, they finally come together right there with a PAC. This looks like repetition here. In fact, it's so much repetition that if he hadn't wanted to do something new in the accompaniment parts, he could have just put double bars on there. So this is like the second repeat. This is the repeat here of the second reprise in the way he's laid it out. I'm using the reprise language because see this? This is, here's an intro and here is section one. He's created a PAC but with overlap that section one and now section two comes to an end here and now we're going to repeat. That's interesting. So if you say it's, in, it's a continuous variation, that really doesn't tell you what form it has. It tells you what's going on in, in the bass, that the pattern is, that the theme is in the bass, uh, perhaps having to do with the chords as well, uh, typically has to do with the chords as well. It tells you something about the details, but it doesn't actually give you the form. So continuous variation is just a starting point. Then you have to say, well, what shape does it take? What are the dimensions? Uh, how many parts are there? And in this case, I think there are two main parts. There's this one, section one, and then a second section that goes to here. And then because of the repetition, we're just getting another reprise. Is that true? Forget my fate. Okay, same tune, same, same. And there's that PAC. That we... So here you've got two statements of part two with a written out repeat and I would argue that that's because of the the accompaniment he wants to do new things and vary it in terms of the accompaniment the inner voices the string parts uh, but binary in form so when you look at a piece that's in continuous variation to know that it's a continuous variation movement does not tell you everything um, you have to look further and listen for cadence points and melodic repetition to determine what kind of shape it actually takes. What is its form? That's your question. Uh, something else that I need to mention before I leave this is that we've got an intro and we've got an outro or a, a conclusion tacked on at the end. This is not huge, so you might want to call it a codetta. Co coda usually means something pretty big. but. Uh, yeah, some framing, front and back, provided by the orchestra. Okay, so pretty neat though that we can see all these cases where the the voice part, the upper melody, and the, the theme and the bass are not in alignment with one another. They're not in sync. And because of that, it creates continuity where otherwise there might have been a whole lot of PACs. A PAC every five bars would be pretty choppy but he creates continuity and momentum by allowing one part to end but the other part pushes through continuing on and even where you have a PAC sometimes there's a bit of overlap and that helps carry the ball forward keeps the momentum going this is continuous variation notice how different this is and with, a, with the sectional variation you got the whole business up for grabs. You can vary it all. Uh, it's like this is the theme. The bass could be altered. The top could be it could be altered. And we usually think of it as the top part, as the, the theme. But there's a lot more to it too. We noticed that, that Mozart was playing off. I mean he's involving the bass quite a bit here. Uh, we noticed the bass line here and the, the, the patterns applied to that, that lower part, everything can be varied, the texture, everything. But here, the theme is not this whole tune and its underpinnings, it's just this little melodic chunk, and even the chords change. That's why I wrote out the chords here, so you can see that he's used different harmonic possibilities, and that's similar, but with the suspension. New chord gets to a four, 
Some of them are the same, but some choices are different. So he can vary these things, but the baseline in this case is what sticks. It's a Pasakalia. The upper parts, they do whatever he wants them to do. They're not tied in. And that, that's really obvious in this case because he presents the bass as its, its own self, all by itself, with no other accompaniment as you first hear it. All right, so very different kind of theme than this sectional variation theme in the Mozart. Good, okay, so we've seen two examples. We've seen uh, Mozart writing sectional variations and here Purcell writing continuous variations. A classical example and a Baroque example.